Good day, Grade 12. Welcome back to this extra lesson in science. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at rates of reaction. And in order to understand rates of reaction, we need to understand the collision theory. Why do I say that? Well, collision theory is used to explain reactions and rates of reaction, okay? In order for a reaction to occur, you have to have certain things happening. And this is what the collision theory follow, explains. One, you have to have the reactant atoms, ions, or molecules collide with each other. If they're just hanging around and they don't actually collide with each other, there's no possibility of a reaction occurring. Okay, that's step one. Step two, the particles must have sufficient energy. Okay, if the particles, I like to relate this to dating. If you are in a room full of people, first of all, you need to meet the people. Okay, so you need to bump into them, and not necessarily physically bump into them, but you actually have to make an interaction with them. You have to meet them and chat to them. Okay, so there has to be a collision. Secondly, the particles must have sufficient energy. Okay, if you walk up to someone and you go hi, and they go hi, you're not going to pursue that reaction. Okay, you're not going to pursue that relationship unless you're desperate because this is the most gorgeous person you've ever seen in your entire life. Um, no, okay, you're going to say, well, thank you very much, nice meeting you, and move on, okay? So you have, to, particles must have sufficient energy. They must be correctly oriented, okay? So in other words, if I am a single female and I'm looking for a male partner, it is no use me have, trying to have an interaction with someone who may be a single female who is looking for a female partner or whatever, okay? So the particles have to be correctly oriented, and I'll put this back in science terms in a second. These three factors have to occur for a reaction to take place, okay? So... And also information needs to be transferred. In other words, for a reaction to occur, you need to transfer, whether it be you um, swap your, okay, I used to say swap the BBM pins, but that BBMs don't really, nobody BBMs anymore. Um, so you need to have to swap your WhatsApp numbers or give your Instagram um, identity or something so that there is a possibility of a reaction happening later because the person can get hold of you. Okay, so now, let me put this in terms of science, okay? The reacting atoms have to collide. They have to collide, okay? They have to come into contact with each other. They have to have sufficient energy. In order for reactions to occur, bonds need to break. Bonds need to break. And in order for bonds to break, okay, you need sufficient energy. Secondly, the particles must be correctly oriented, okay? In other words, if you've got a dipole and this side is slightly positive and this side is slightly negative, and you've got another dipole, but this side is slightly negative and this side is slightly positive, then it's not going to work, okay? They have to be correctly oriented because you need for them to be able to bond. And then finally, obviously, bonds need to be broken for reaction to occur, okay? But these three are the main factors. So if they ever ask you to explain using collision theory how reactions work, you need to use these three factors, okay? The fact that one, atoms, ions, and molecules must collide, they must have sufficient energy to have a reaction, and they must be correctly oriented. Those are the three biggies, okay? Right, so let's move on. So now, in order for this to happen, you need to have, remember we said, sufficient energy. Now, if you think of a glass of water, okay, what you need to understand is in your water molecules, okay, the water, okay, even if it's just a glass of water that's sitting on the side of your desk that your mother's brought you because she insists that you can't just drink Coca-Cola or random stuff, okay? So she's brought you a glass of water. It's very sweet of her in case you get thirsty while you're studying, okay? No more of this just coffee stuff, okay? So in the water, water container, let's pretend there's no ions. Let's pretend it's pure distilled water. There's no magnesium, sodium, potassium, any of those ions, okay? The water molecules are continuously breaking up into 2H+, plus plus OH, let's try again. Uh, let's not do it like that. Okay, right. The water molecules are continuously breaking up into H plus and OH minus ions. Okay. So 
there is a continuous dynamic equilibrium happening, okay? The molecules are continuously moving around and they are breaking up and getting back together, okay? So you need to understand that within this container, there are some molecules that have got huge amounts of energy and some molecules that have very small amounts of energy, just like in a normal classroom where you've got some kids that are hyper and some kids that are sit at the back and maybe utter a word once in a blue moon. That's what the molecules in a container are like. And it doesn't matter what the container is made up of, if it's filled with water or any type of gas, okay? So Maxwell Boltzmann, there are two gentlemen, Mr. Maxwell and Mr. Boltzmann, in grade 12, some textbooks will call this the Boltzmann Maxwell curve. It's the same curve. It just depends who was writing the textbook. Oh, I don't know why they swapped the Mercury. But for us, we call it the Maxwell Boltzmann curve. It shows the amount of energy of the molecules, okay? So what this table shows us is that this is the number of molecules and this is the amount of energy per molecule. And it's saying that most of the molecules have like an average amount of energy, okay? Then they're kind of on the average. So most of the molecules have an average amount of energy. Very few molecules have got very little bit of energy. And then you've got all these molecules which have enough energy to react. Okay, remember we said one of the things that they had to do, other than collide, was that they had to have enough energy to react, okay? These molecules, yeah, all these molecules, yeah, above this line, and I'll tell you about this line in a minute, okay, have enough energy to react. And this energy line is called the activation, activation energy, the activation energy. And this is the minimum energy required for a reaction to occur. Okay, so the activation energy is the minimum energy required for a reaction to occur. Okay, the minimum energy required for action reaction to occur. And that is called the activation energy. So majority of the atoms don't have enough energy to react, okay? This light here do, okay? And we're going to talk a little bit more about how we can influence this, how we can change that, okay? So let's carry on. So we can look at the factors affecting the rates of reactions. So the first one is types of reactants, okay? Second is surface area. Third is concentration of reactants. Fourth is pressure of gas. And fifth is temperature of reaction. And a lot of times people group these two together because they are kind of the same thing. Concentration of reactants tends to be in your solids, or more like in your liquids, and your liquids, okay? And, and Okay, and aqueous solutions, aqueous solutions, not in liquids because liquids have got a pure concentration. So the concentration is your aqueous solutions. Your pressure of gas and concentration is number of, unit, number of particles per unit volume. Your pressure is also a measure of the number of particles per unit volume. Okay, so therefore those two there are kind of the same thing. Okay, just in different phases, but we'll talk about it. And then the last one is the presence of a catalyst. Okay, so again, types of reactants, surface area, concentration slash pressure, temperature of the reaction mixture, and presence of a catalyst. Okay, so we're now going to talk through these sections and we're going to talk about these factors. Okay, so let's get going. So first of all, the type of reactants. Okay, so some substances are more reactive than others. Okay, so let's just look at an example of some paper and a pencil on piece on a desk, a wooden desk. Now, thank goodness, when we put our pad of paper and a pencil on the wooden desk, they don't react. Okay, now I know some of you are going to go, ah, but you know. This is actually paper, which is made of a wood, so why should they react? But the point is that there's metal, a, a spiral over here, and this is covered in paint, and they're still not reacting, and chances are this isn't a real wooden disc, it's probably plastic, okay? But it's just going. Okay, so 
The point is that some things don't react. And you guys know this. You're sitting on a chair and the chair hasn't randomly exploded because you're sitting on it. Well, at least hope not. Okay, it hasn't burst into flames. Some substances do not react with others. However, there are some substances like this one where you've got sodium that when you place it in water, explodes. Okay, so let's go back to that. Yeah, you've got sodium. Okay, it's a little piece of sodium and they are putting it in water and I suspect by the reaction in the tiny piece of sodium that they've actually heated this water, but that's beside the point. So as they reacted, you can see it has a flame and then it explodes. Okay, so sodium has a very is very reactive with water. In fact, all your group one metals, your sodium, potassium, lithium, um, cesium, are all very, very explosive with water and water vapor. Okay, so let's not put that in water. Now, surface area. Increasing the surface area of the reactants increases the rate of the reaction. Okay, that makes sense, okay? Why does that make sense? Think about this way before we show you the little video. Okay, wait, before I show you the video. If you've got, and I'm gonna use the typical example that teachers use all the time. If you have to use, start a fire, say you're on Survivor, or any type of big rolls, you're with big rolls, and you're out there trying to survive in the wild, okay? Are you going to, listen, stop it. Are you going to use a log of wood, okay, to start your fire. Here's your flame, okay, your little one single match that you got given, that you were lucky to find, that you've slit off the rough beard on your face if you're a male. Or, okay, I just wanna stop this thing from playing just a second, it's driving me insane. Okay, where is this? Okay, where is that? I don't know why it's decided that. Let's just go to animations and I don't want it to stop. I mean, I don't want it to, let's just delete that. There we go. Okay, let's carry on. Uh, Sideshow from, from current slide. Sorry about that. So, okay, so you're not going to use um, the log, okay, with your little match, okay? Because why? Because that match is going to heat up this tea piece of the log and the match is actually going to burn out and burn your fingers before it can. But what are you going to use? You're going to little use twigs, okay? You can use little twigs with some dry leaves and big surface area and you are going to use your match to try and light that. Now think about this. Think about this in the term of a cube, okay? In terms of a cube. If you've got a cube, okay, and you try and light it, with say for example a candle because that's what I'm drawing. Okay, do you agree it's only going to heat up the one little patch that is underneath? That's all it's going to do. Okay, this is supposed to be underneath it in the middle, okay? Whereas if I go and I take my cube and I chop it, okay, let's say I chop it like this and like this and like that and I chop it like that. So there's tons of space between all these sides. Do you agree that suddenly now this flame's heat can go in there, it can go in there, it can go in there, it can go through there, and there's tons of space for the flame to get to all the different surfaces because now there's tons of little cubes, okay? So for that reason, this energy can reach way more surface area, okay? So now I'm going to show you the video. Okay, where's the ink? And I'm going to click. And there we go, and I'm going to play it. And what you'll see is that they're going to be burning some iron, but it's iron filings, okay? And you'll notice how quickly that reaction happens. Look how quickly there's iron, or that it's basically iron that you would use in to clean your pots, okay? Whereas, okay, whereas. Not going to touch a thing now. Okay. So there you've got your iron filings effectively. And look how quickly that reaction is happening. Those things are burning and it's getting red, red hot to get a white hot almost. Okay. Whereas if you've got a solid piece of iron, look how slowly it's reacting. You will notice over here 
that it slowly starts. I mean, yeah, slowly starts getting a bit. There it is. There, slowly starts getting red. Okay, so you can see that the solid is actually going to have a much um, greater time. To, it take a much longer time to reach. Um, to, to react, okay? And why is this important? Well, this is important in the sense of if you guys have ever taken any type of tablets, okay, if you have the option to take, for example, panados, you have panados that are in pill form, or let's say grandpas, you get grandpa pod, grandpa tablets, okay, and then you get grandpa powders, okay? Now, I'm not advocating I'm not advocating that you take the grandpa powders because I actually don't know how good they are for you. But let's pretend, okay, that they're good for you. All good for you. Which one do you think is going to react faster in your body? Obviously, the powder is going to react much faster in your body than the pill, okay? Because there's a way greater surface area. There's a tiny little bit of bad dust that is in this thing here and that is going to have a huge reaction in your body and a much faster reaction than your pull that still has to dissolve and then increase its surface area okay so now let's talk concentration so concentration is given by the number of moles per unit volume so the unit is a mole and it's actually not a capital it's mole per decimeter cubed. Why? Because the unit, the SI unit for volume is decimeter cubed, okay? And we're talking the number of moles per unit volume. But we're effectively talking about the number of particles per unit volume, agreed? So as the concentration of the reaction rate increases, so does the reaction rate. Okay, and now I need to quickly um, disappear for a second because I need to get this up and running. Give me half a second. Okay, I'll be back in a second. Okay, no, that's not what I want. You should still be able to hear me. Give me a second. It's just that this thing, I need to swap computers and that. So give me half a second to find this. Um... Okay, it's almost there. Just a second. What this is, is a simulation by this um, website called uh, PHET. We've actually shown you stuff from it before, where um, they actually give you simulations. It's by the University of Colorado, which is actually a very good university. There we go. I found it. And we just want to get it going. Hmm. There it is. Okay, let me show you what's going on. Sorry about that. We just had to. Um, there we go. I just had to get this going. Okay, so what we've got here is a simulation by the PHET website. If you ever want to use a simulation to try and understand what's going on in science and that, I really suggest I really strongly suggest you go to this website they've got so many pretty cool investment investigations and experiments theoretical experiments that you can do okay so we're gonna ignore this one and what we're gonna do is do a bar graph and you'll see why now so what we're gonna do is we've got the option of making some reaction happen, okay? so we're gonna pump in some a atoms okay and then we're going to pump in some b seam atoms and what we're going to do then is raise the temperature a little bit just to get the reaction going okay and then i want you to see what happens okay so first off we're going to start off and what are we talking about is concentration okay so we're going to start off with just i don't know two of these okay and then let's start off with 
three of those, four of those. Okay, now if you look over here, you can see we've got two A's here and we've got five B's. I pumped in five B's. Okay, so you can see that they bounce around each other, but they're pretty slow. There's not much happening. Okay, so really not much is going on over here. Okay, but what happens if I increase the concentration? What if I add some more A molecules? Let's say I add lot more A molecules to this. Okay, and what, do you see they start bumping and bouncing and they're moving quite a bit faster, okay? Therefore, also, I'm gonna put some B, extra BC molecules in. So now I've got extra ones, and do you see that immediately that I did that, suddenly we've got some A, B, and some C molecules forming. And why is that? That is because I've increased the concentration. So I've increased the possibility that there's going to be reactions, possibility that there's going to be bumping. And if there's a bumping happening, then there is a greater chance of collisions occurring. Okay, and we need to talk about this word collisions. Okay, but we will in a minute. Okay, let's just see. Okay, so let's just leave that right now. So as the concentration of reactions increase, so does the reaction rate, okay? The reason being, the greater the concentration of reactants means that there are more particles of reactants per unit volume, right? Therefore, there's a more likelihood of more, and listen, great talks, this is the most important phrase ever, the more effective collisions per unit time. Grade 12s, if you ever explain anything with respect to reaction rates and collisions and collision theory and you do not use the phrase more effective collisions per unit time you might as well throw those marks in the bin okay everything your whole explanation you can say that there's a greater concentration of the reactants and then more particles in the reactant per unit volume and you can say therefore there's more likelihood of collisions bang thank you for playing throw away those marks just gone Okay, you need to say there's a greater chance or more likelihood, a greater chance of more effective collisions per unit time. Why? Because effective means that they result in a reaction. That means that they are a collision where the particles are correctly oriented and they have enough energy to have a reaction okay so that is what we, that whole thing includes all that okay so you need to you need to say that it's there's a greater chance or more likelihood whatever of more effective collisions per unit time grade 12s I stress this so much with my students I joke with them and I say that if I have to wake them up at three o'clock in the morning I don't know why I would do that but if I did okay I would want them to say if I say to them why is the reaction rate greater and if they did not say because they more effective collisions for unit time then they'd failed okay you know, that's how strongly I urge you that you need to know this okay so let's go through that again concentration the more con the greater the concentration the more particles there are in the area obviously then there is more likelihood that they're gonna bump into each other right so therefore there is a greater chance of there being more effective collisions per unit time. Because if there's more bumping, then there's a greater chance that you're gonna bump into someone or into another particle that's correctly oriented and has the right amount of energy. Again, thinking about it in the dating scene, think about it this way. If you're going to a party and there's like six people at the party, what are the chances, let's get real, what are the chances of you meeting your ideal person, okay? But if you go to a party and you don't know these people, okay? And you go to the party and there's a hundred other people there and let's pretend that you're a major socialite, okay? There is a greater chance of you bumping into someone there that has got the same, the right amount of energy and is correctly oriented to have an effective collision. Okay, understand. Now, I'm not saying you must all go out and party. Okay, I'm just saying that that's how the science works. Okay, so now let's talk about pressure. Okay, the pressure of the reactants is the same as concentration, really. As the pressure of the reactants increase, so does the reaction rate, okay? Remember, pressure is given as force per unit area. Okay, but let's think about this. The higher the pressure, the more particles of gas per unit volume, okay? And therefore, there's a greater likelihood of more effective collisions per unit time. Okay, so what is this about the force per unit area? Think about the fact that you have a container and 
the way that we measure pressure is force per unit area. But if these particles, if there's a greater pressure, then these particles are going to have be bumping into each other and into the walls. And if they bump into the walls all the time, there's going to be more force felt by the walls, okay? And there's going to be more bumping into each other. Because generally, the way that you increase the pressure is by decreasing the volume. There are two ways you can increase the pressure. You can decrease the volume of the container or you can increase the temperature. Those are two ways. By increasing the temperature, you're increasing the kinetic energy of the particles and then you're increasing, making them move faster and therefore they will hit the walls more regularly and with a greater speed and therefore there will be more inverted commas pressure. Okay, but most importantly, the higher the pressure, the more particles of gas per unit volume, the greater likelihood of there being more effective collisions per unit time. Okay, get it. Okay, now let's talk temperature. And this is very important, grade 12s. You need to learn this. This is very, very important. This is a very, very important definition they love to ask. They not, not just like to ask it in this section, it's also they love asking it in the chemical equilibrium section and they like asking it in the organic chemistry section. Okay, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles of a substance. Note average kinetic energy of the particles. Okay, so now let's again look at my little demo. Where is it? There it is. Okay. Okay, reset all. Yes. So now let's say, okay, fine, we're going to put some A in. One, two, okay, so we've got five A's, okay? And let's say we got, uh, what have we got? Six B's. Okay, right. Now let's raise the temperature. So do you see that, oh, let's just put a bar chart up there. Do you see we've got no products? We've got no A, B's, no C's, okay? But let's see what happens if I increase the temperature. So if I increase the temperature, do you see the particles start moving much faster? Okay, and as soon as they start moving it much faster, they start making more of the product. Okay, and you can see that this is changing. The reason this is changing is because I've dropped the temperature again. So what is happening is that they're slowing down a little bit and you're having a bit of reverse reaction happening. This is a dynamic um, equilibrium type reaction. It's, it's a di I mean, it can basically go both ways. So therefore, you'll notice that it's trying to reach dynamic equilibrium. And it's slowly going back to the fact that A and B are going to have more and A, B and C are going to be less. But what should happen to the if I increase the temperature? Whee! We end up with, and we haven't ever decided if this was endothermic or exothermic. So all that they're doing is showing that there's a reaction happening. And the more we speed this up, the more this is going to change until we end up with a whole bunch of reactants. Let's see what happens if I lower the temperature. So we've got some ice particles and I lower it. So as I lower it, what happens to the speed of these particles? They get slower and slower and slower. And do you see that this isn't changing? Okay, it's not changing at all. Okay. And actually from this, you can see that there are more products than there are reactants. It might have just been because that's where we were at at the time. But if that's the case, then this would be an exothermic reaction. But that's without the point. Okay, so let's raise the temperature again. Okay, and let's see what happens. Speed it, and there we go, we let it go up. While the temperature is hot, you can see beautiful reactions occurring. There's lots of different things happening here, and the temperature is still hot, and we're getting a lot of a reactions occurring. Okay, so why is that? By increasing the temperature, do you agree we're, why won't this minimize, minimize? By increasing the temperature, we're increasing the average rate of the reaction. And why is that? Because by increasing the temperature, we're increasing the average kinetic energy of the particles, which means the particles are moving faster. Okay, and if they're moving faster, it means there are more collisions per unit time. I'll talk about effective in a second. There are more collisions per unit time, and the particles who have a higher kinetic energy um, 
so therefore they're more likely to connect, uh, to react when colliding. So there are more collisions per unit time. So we're not talking effective collisions yet. We're just talking about the fact that if the particle is moving faster, it means that they are got more bumping happening, right? Not only that, but since they have got a higher temperature, it means they've got a, a higher kinetic energy. And if they've got a higher kinetic energy, it means that they're more likely to react on colliding. So it's a double burn. So on that note, if you ever get asked the question of what is more effective in changing the reaction rate and you're given temperature, pressure, concentration, whatever, the winner is always temperature, okay? An increase, an increase of 10 degrees Celsius doubles the reaction rate. Okay, similarly, if you take it down, it's gonna halve the reaction rate, but an increase in 10 degrees Celsius, just 10 degrees Celsius, doubles the reaction rate, okay? So it's a twin-fold thing. It not only makes the particles move faster, which means they are more likely to bump into each other, but on top of that, because they've got more kinetic energy, they are more likely to react when they collide, okay? So temperature is a biggie, okay? Now let's talk catalyst, okay? Catalyst. So the definition of a catalyst, and yes, you do need to learn the definition of a catalyst. Yes, you do. A, is a substance that lowers the activation energy of a reaction without participating in the reaction. It allows an alternate path for the reaction. Okay. So if you see on the right here, we've got this little picture of a guy, and he's climbing the mountain. Okay, and you can see they're both racing and they've got racing numbers on them. Okay, and here's the finish line. Okay, and this guy is climbing and he's going over the mountain and she is zooming through the mountain. Okay, now you need to understand this. Okay, this is very important is that if the particles have enough energy, they're going to react anyway. So they don't need to follow the route of the catalyst, okay? The catalyst provides an alternative path, okay? But if they've got enough energy, they're going to take that route. They're going to go in that route anyway, okay? But if they don't have enough energy, then the catalyst provides an alternate route which has uses less energy, okay? So it's not that all the particles are going to take the route of the catalyst. Those that have more than enough energy, they're above the activation energy, they're going to react anyway, okay? This is for the particles that weren't going to react. They weren't necessarily going to react, okay? And now what's happened is they've lowered the activation energy so that they can react, okay? So, and I will do this a bit later and we'll talk about the Maxwell-Boltzmann curve again, but just to give you an idea, if we're looking at the Maxwell-Boltzmann curve, graph and this is the number of particles okay and this was the energy do you remember the graph looked like this it was kind of like that okay and this year was the activation energy and all these particles had enough energy to react okay now what happens is in it with you so they can these particles are going to react anyway it doesn't matter Okay, what happens is the catalyst comes along and goes, hello, I can lower the activation energy to over here. So now all these particles can react as well. Okay, do you understand? So let's talk about it in terms of the hill and the road. The catalyst allows for an alternate path for the reaction, which requires less energy. So they're both gonna get to the finish line. Okay, they're both gonna get there. The chick in the car, looks like a chick anyway, a chick in the car is going to get there faster, admittedly. Why? Because she has required, requires less energy to get there, okay? The dude will get there, but unless we know otherwise, unless there's something else that happens, he's going to take a longer time. Now, what's important about this is a catalyst doesn't participate in the reaction at all, okay? So in other words, a lot of times they use nice, beautiful, very precious metals like platinum and nickel, okay, not that precious, but still, to be act as a 
as a catalyst. And what is cool about that is that they can take a piece of platinum and they can put it in a reaction and it can act as a catalyst for say 20, 30 years, okay, inside that container. And then maybe after 20, 30 years, they decide to dismantle that piece of equipment. And they can take out the piece of platinum and clean off the other stuff around it, all the other chemicals off it, and then they can make a piece of jewelry out of it or sell it or whatever. There is nothing wrong with that platinum. It hasn't been eaten away. It hasn't been corroded. It is still exactly the same piece of platinum it was when they put it in originally, okay? No reactions have occurred to it, okay? Right, so now let's talk about measuring rates of reaction. So there are a couple of ways that we can measure the rate of reaction, but before we do that, we need to talk about how we would work it out. So the rate of reaction can be measured as the amount of product formed per unit time or the amount of reactants used up per unit time. Okay, so that's the rate of the reaction. So we can either look at the amount of product formed or the amount of reactants used up. So we could either look at, for example, how much gas is given off, or we could look at how much of the volume of the container has gone down or something like that, okay? But remember, it's per unit time. So you're just saying to me, oh, look, 50 mils of gas is formed. That's not the rate. That is how much is formed. We need to say how much per unit time. Okay, the yield of the reaction is the amount of products formed. Okay, and it's based on the amount of reactants. Okay, so we're going to talk about those again, but let's talk about how you would measure reaction rates. So there are different things that we need to measure and you need to know the difference between quantitative and qualitative. So quantitative is numerical. Okay, we can give a number to it. Whereas qualitative is kind of observation. So for scientists, scientists prefer quantitative answers because we can put a number to it, okay? So in other words, if I say measure the rate of gas at which the gas volume is produced, I wanna know it is um, six decimeters cubed per minute. That's an awesome answer to me because then I know exactly the concentrate, what's the rate. When I'm looking at the rate of precipitation formed and I say, okay, it took me uh, about three minutes for this precipitation to form, that doesn't really help me. And I'll talk to you, I'll show you a video that explains to you what the problem is with that, okay? So, Turbidity is a fancy word for rate of precipitation formed, okay? Another thing is the change of color, which again is qualitative. And then there's the change of mass of the reaction vessel, which is quantitative, quantitative. So quantitative means we can put a number on it. And qualitative is observation. It's always we look at it and we can see the change, okay? Now, what is the problem with qualitative? Well, if you've ever done a titration, then you guys will know that you're looking at a color change. And I might look at the color change and see a color change going now. Whereas my buddy might think that it went a little bit before, a little bit after what I thought, okay? So obviously that doesn't work so well because it's dependent on me and my opinion as to whether when the color change occurred. There is not a specific data, that point that can be put to it because we are observing it, okay? So let's talk again before we carry on about measuring the rate of gas volume produced. So the way that you would measure gas, okay, there are two ways you can do it. The one is through water. Um, the other way, which is this normal, this is a normal way, is you have a bunch of reactants and they will produce a gas. And so you put the reactants in, you put the cork in with this little tube and this syringe starts over here. And as the reaction progresses, this syringe is pushed out. And what we do is we measure at certain times the amount of gas that is formed. We don't wait to the ending and go, oh, look, we've got 10 mils of gas. We go, okay, after 10 seconds, we got this. Over 20 seconds, we got this. And what you will generally see is this type of graph if we had to uh, plot it. So if I had to just change a little bit, it would probably be something along the lines of this, okay? So during the first, I don't know, one second, this might be this might be the amount where the person is after one second. Then after two seconds, it might be over here. 
Then after three seconds, it might be over here, and four seconds, and you get the point. So there's less and less amount of gas that's being produced, okay? So there's going to be a steep, if I plot the volume of the gas versus time, there's going to be a nice steep gradient at the start of the reaction because this is where the fastest reaction rate occurs. Then the gradient is slowly going to decrease as the reaction rate slows. And then finally, the gradient is going to become zero. And when this gradient becomes zero, it shows that the reaction has stopped. No more gas is produced. Now, grade 12, you have to be careful because when you guys get parallel lines in chemical equilibria, it means it's reached dynamic equilibrium. 90% of the time, it's reached dynamic equilibrium. When we talk in reaction rates, the reaction has run to completion. It has stopped. There's no more stuff happening, okay? That's not reached dynamic equilibrium. The reaction has run to completion. It has stopped, okay? And that's important, and you really need to remember that. And on that note, I'm going to stop for the night. Okay, we will carry on with reaction rates and um, possibly do some questions on reaction rates in the on exam questions in lesson tomorrow. Please remember that your grade 12 lesson tomorrow is at four o'clock since it's Friday. Have a wonderful day. Cheers.